My name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'm your host for today's final Field to Fork webinar of the 2024 season. This has been brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension. And I have a special thanks to Scott Swanson for hosting when I was attending conferences the last two weeks. So thank you, Scott. This is the ninth year that we have done this series, and we're really glad that all of you have joined us today. As of today, we have had a total of more than 1,700 viewers, plus all of our watch parties for the live webinars, and that is a record. So thanks again for to all of you for making this a very successful year, and we're already planning for next year. We have archived all of the webinars from previous years, and the link is on our Field to Fork webinar page that will be sent to you. And I do want to extend a special welcome to our watch parties. We are providing a certificate of attendance on the website, and it will be posted with the recording. The next slide shows the webinar controls. Because of our large number of participants, we invite you to post your questions and comments in the chat box. So let's practice and find the chat box. You can ignore the Q&A box because I am not going to look at that. Click to open the chat and type your city and state where you are right now. While you work on that, the next slide is an acknowledgement. I have a special request. This program is sponsored in part with grant funding from the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service and the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. I will ask all of you to complete a short online survey that will be emailed to you right after today's webinar. And as a thank you, we will continue to provide prizes to the lucky winners of the random drawings. And you can win more than one prize, so keep answering the surveys. Be sure to put your complete address on the form. You will need to scroll down to today's date because we are combining our data from 2023 and 2024. So scroll down and enter where that is. And again, Welcome to today's webinar, and I am pleased to introduce today's speaker. In a unique joint appointment between Kansas State University and the University of Missouri, Melanda Vanderwall Nowadiki currently serves as State Extension Food Safety Specialist for both Kansas and Missouri. She works with county and district extension agents and other stakeholders in both states as well as with the entire region to help develop resources in food safety and she focuses on consumer, producer, grower and farmers market vendor issues. In June 2024, Londa will be moving closer to me. She is going to return to her native South Dakota to serve as department head of the South Dakota State University Dairy and Food Science Department. So welcome, Londa, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Julie, for the invitation. Um, it's uh, been uh, wonderful to, to work with uh, Dr. Garden Robinson over the years and to be um, part of this webinar series. And we're so glad so many of you are on today. Um, looks like another uh, good crowd. So, um, so yes, our North Central region has... Um, I think maybe I'm a little bit biased, but um, has really done a great job of, of working together and, and sharing resources uh, with each other. You know, these a lot of these topics are the same no matter what state you're in. It doesn't really, um, you know, that the it's not limited to one particular state. So, so I really do appreciate um, working together with our colleagues in other states. And so, um, welcome to all of you who might be from all sorts of different states uh, across the region and the U.S. So um, glad you could be here today. So I'm going to talk about, um, as you can see the title here, um, so I'll be talking about produce growing and I'll, I'll um, I guess I'll go to my uh, overview slide here. So I'll talk a little bit about why food safety is important. And I know for some of you, you've probably heard this many times, but um, you know, just a refresher of why food safety is important. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about produce safety regulations and um, certifications that, um, if, particularly if you're selling produce that you might be asked to have. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about just produce safety basics. So uh, whether you're going to be 
eating the food yourself or selling it or donating it, um, those will be just the basic things that everybody should know and should be using those practices. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit at the end about um, donating food specifically. So a little bit about kind of the regulations and best practices behind just donating any type of food. And, and in this case, produce is what we're particularly interested in. But so um, as I mentioned, you know, I know that some of you have probably heard this information many times before, um, you know, so I know that this for many of you, this is kind of old hat, I guess, but um but, you know, food safety is really important um, for you if you're producing food. So you really want to make sure that you're producing products that are as safe as possible. Um, you know, I have never met any farmers or, or gardeners or food producers, you know, that that want to make people sick. I, I know that, you know, there is some cases that happen out there. But, um, you know, the, the farmers and the producers, again, the gardeners and all the food people that I work with, you know, they're really, they are wanting to provide a safe product. Um, the, also in today's society, we have to think about um, liability. And so particularly if you're selling your food or even if you're donating it, um, you know, it's important to think about that aspect of things um, and just protecting your markets and making sure that people don't even think that they might have gotten sick from your food. We don't want them to even think that because that can cause problems too. Um, you know, if you are selling your produce, um, you want to impress your customers. You know, you can get more sales if you're um, doing a good job and helping people to see that, um, you know, you are concerned with product safety and quality. And then, you know, if you are selling your produce, um, you do have to meet regulations as well. And, and um, there are regulations in place because unfortunately there have been foodborne outbreaks related to produce and related to other foods in the past. And we just want to prevent that as much as possible. So, um, you know, one important thing to keep in mind with food safety is that, um, you know, food safety is not we don't think about, you know, food safety practices only for the sake of safe food, which of course, you know, those are really important. But um, but also when you're using good practices for food safety, that can also help improve your quality of your product as well as the shelf life of your product, which, which is great. You know, when you look at those beautiful strawberries in that top picture or those tomatoes there, you know, you want them to last as long as possible. You don't want to have... Um, you know, good strawberries for a day or two days. Like it'd be nice if they could last for four or five, whatever it is. They'd be nice to have them last for longer. So um, so it is really important to to think about things like temperature control, um, you know, and sanitation. Those are two big ones that are really important for food safety, but they're also um, beneficial for improving the quality of your produce as well as the shelf life. Um, so if you're... Um, you know, if you're doing those good practices like temperature control, you're getting your um, strawberries into a cooler as quickly as possible. And with tomatoes, you don't want them too cold. Um, at 45 degrees, I believe, is about the right temperature. You don't want it to get too cold and they get kind of woody and tough. But but anyway, temperature control is really important. It'll help to make help you have more pounds of product to sell. So if you're selling your product, um, you want to reduce water loss. You don't want to have evaporation um, and that water going. If you're selling those um, tomatoes by the pound, you know, the more pounds you can sell, the better. Um and then also, of course, just preventing early spoilage and bad appearance, you know, extending shelf life that just helps increase your profits. You know, if you're again, if you're selling like in a farmer's market, boy, it'd be great if you can sell the tomatoes on Saturday and whatever leftover ones you could sell if you have a Wednesday market or, you know, maybe even the next week. Um, it would be great to be able to sell it um, for a longer period of time before you have to do something else with it. So foodborne illness does happen. So unfortunately, there are foodborne illnesses. Um, you can see the statistics that are listed there. Um, and the thing that I do want to point out is that, um, you know, and if I when I teach these sort of things in in person classes, you know, I'll sometimes will ask the audience to raise their hand if they've ever had, you know, what they think if they've ever had, you know, stomach issues, vomiting, diarrhea type of issues. And, and a lot of people have. And um, the thing is, like a lot of times we don't go to the doctor for it 
Or even if you do go to the doctor, the doctor has to take a stool sample and, and be able to trace it back to a particular food product. So, um, you know, foodborne illness happens a lot more than we, we know about as well. Um, it can happen at any scale of production. So it doesn't matter if you're a large producer or a small producer, it can happen. Um, so we just all need to use good practices, you know, no matter the size of your, the, the scale of your production. Um, let me see. So it is really, um, it is important to think too about um, our most vulnerable populations to foodborne illness are the young, the old, the pregnant and the sick. Their bodies just can't handle um, pathogens that might be there as much as a, a healthy adult. Um, and those are the ones that we really want them eating produce, you know, or, I mean, everybody should be eating more produce, but you know, uh, these groups in particular, we want them to eat fresh, healthy produce. So we also need to make sure it's, it's safe as well. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, certifications and regulations related to if you're selling produce. So this is for those of you that might be interested in selling, you know, whether it's at a farmer's market or, to, um, you know, through a CSA or a farm stand or to a grocery store or a school or, um, you know, a distributor of some sort. Um, there's something that you might hear if, if you're wanting to sell to places like maybe a school, um, sometimes a grocery store, um, possibly, and more likely if you're selling it to a distributor or broker of some sort, they might ask you, um, they might ask you to be GAP certified. So there's also, you know, somebody might say, well, you need to use GAPs or you need to use good agricultural practices. If they're saying to you, you just need to use those good agricultural practices, generally speaking, that just means use good practices for raising produce safely. So just you, and, and we'll talk more about those in a little bit, but um, if, if you're asked to just use those good agricultural practices, that's just making sure you're using good practices. If the buyer, again, maybe like a school or a grocery store or a distributor, if they're asking you to be GAP certified, then that's another step on top of that. So um, GAP certification is, um, it's not regulatory. Um, it's not a governmental regulation. It's just that buyer might ask you to be um, GAP certified. So if you wanna sell to that buyer, then you have to say, well, if I want to sell to them, I have to be GAP certified. So if I don't want to get GAP certified, then I don't have to sell to them. And um, then you have to find another market for your product. So um, so it's 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 a little bit confusing because um, USDA does do GAP certification. Um, they're also, of course, a, a regulatory body on the meat and poultry side. But, um, but for GAP certification, um, USDA is one entity that does GAP certification. You can also go to other third parties, there's Primus and there's Global Gap and there's others as well. But um, but just wanted to, to mention that. And we have a fact sheet, I'll show our website later, that talks about the differences between um, GAPs, certification and um, regulations. So this next slide talks about regulations related to produce safety. So, um, so there is, um, for the first time, there was um, federal governmental regulations um, for the harvesting of produce, sorry, it's listed there for production, harvest, and handling of fruits and vegetables. Um, the final rule for that was released in November of 2015. So man, that's almost been 10 years now, or, you know, nine and a half or whatever, uh, or eight and a half, sorry. But anyway, it's been, you know, it's been a while now since that final rule was released. Um, so this, um, and again, it gets a little bit confusing because the requirements are similar to GAPS, but again, GAPS is a buyer requirement. It's GAP certification is a buyer requirement. But but so the governmental regulations um, is um, is newer. Um, GAP certification for produce has been around longer. So um, this um, you know many times people will ask, well, okay, am I covered by the produce safety rule? So um, there is a number of exemptions and even what they call exclusions to the produce safety rule. So smaller producers are not covered. So I'll go through these here. So if you're selling less than $25,000 worth of produce per year, um, and that's on average over the last three years, and actually that dollar figure is adjusted for inflation, so it's higher than that now, but 
more, we have more details. Again, there's more details on our website, but you're exempt if you're a smaller producer, you know, just getting started, just selling maybe at your local farmer's market, you would be exempt um, from this rule. Um, if you're producing produce that's really consumed raw, such as pumpkin, you know, that's, that's, it, it's really things like strawberries, tomatoes, lettuce that we're really concerned about for this particular rule. Um, if you're selling produce that's going to be um, commercially processed before consumption, then that's not covered either. So if you're selling tomatoes to a canner, um, then that produce would not be covered either. Um, and then we have something called what, you know, is called our qualified exemption, or some people call it like the local foods exemption. Um, but so if, and, and by the way, this is at the federal level. So this is across all states. Um, so on average, over the past three years, if you have less than $500,000 of annual food sales, um, and so food in this case includes animal feed, as and again, this is just for the purposes of calculating if you're covered by this exemption or not, um, less than $500 of annual food sales, and the majority of your food is sold directly to a qualified end user. So um, a qualified end user is is like direct to consumer within your state and some other things there. Again, there, we have a lot more information on our website about this, but, um, but then you would be exempt if you meet this kind of local foods or qualified exemption, um, but you do have to still keep records. Um, so if you're not covered by any of those exemptions that I mentioned, then you are covered by the rule. Um, but if you ever have a foodborne disease outbreak linked to your produce, then you, then you've lost your exemption. So, okay. So, um, just to kind of now think about, okay, so I've talked about the regulatory side of things. Now this applies to anyone, whether you're just consuming your produce or whether you're selling it or donating it. Um, you know, this, these next slides will, are just the good food safety practices you should use. So when we think about our produce, you know, um, of course, there's a number of different inputs. And um, I know you've had uh, this ser webinar series has had other great speakers talk about more of the production side of things. So when we're thinking about producing produce, you know, there's soil or if it's hydroponics, it's um, water, but um, you got the soil coming in, you have the water that you're using, there's buildings, equipment, tools, you know, what you're harvesting with. Um, animals can be part of the picture. Um, you know, depending on where you are in the U.S., the animals might be different, but um, there could be birds to, uh, if you're going outdoors or even if you're going indoors, it can happen too. And then, of course, humans are picking or are doing different things with the produce. So, you know, humans come into play as well. Um, so this picture, you know, kind of shows um, like one of my colleagues calls it like the worst case scenario uh, for growing produce, you know, just to think about all the things that could happen. Um, we just want to prevent these things from happening as much as possible. We know that we can't eliminate every potential risk, but we just try to reduce the risks as much as we can. So um, again, you can see in the picture the different risks that could be there, you know, so from animals, um, the animal feces going into the produce itself or into the water, um, you know, feces from wildlife, birds overhead, um, you know, it's hard to control birds uh, many times, but we'll talk more about that. Some things that we can do to reduce these risks as much as possible. So the first um, category that we'll talk about is in soil amendments. So um, soil amendments is something that you're adding to the soil to make the soil more fertile or, or you know, better in some way, able to produce crops better. Um, so raw manure is a big one that we, that we, um, is in this category and, you know, compost, if it's properly composted, you can call it compost. But, um, so you always have to think about, you know, that there is potential for, for raw manure in particular to contaminate, um, your soil. So, um, you can still use raw manure. It's fine. You just have to make sure you're using it properly. Um, so, always be th all the things listed here, you have to think through, okay, when am I applying the, um, if it's manure, when am I applying that manure? When am I harvesting? Um, you know, if you apply it in the fall and then you're harvesting the next summer, that, that should be enough. My next slide talks more about that. Um, if you are, um, 
you know, composting your, your manure, you have to properly compost it if you're going to call it compost. So I, I won't go into details on that today, but, um, so then where are you storing it? You know, is there potential for runoff? If it's raining, um, where does, you know, that runoff from that compost pile or the manure pile go? Um, wind, you know, I know um, states in this region get a lot of wind. So what happens if the wind is blowing and where does that uh, potential contamination go? So um, the next slide here gives us kind of a nice rule of thumb to think about um, if you are using um, compo or if you are using sorry raw manure um you know so manure that has not been properly composted um you need to it's the best practice would be to wait 120 days between the time that you apply the manure and when you're harvesting so um you know, if you're growing peppers or tomatoes, whatever this is, I think that's tomatoes. Um, if you're growing tomatoes, you know, if you're applying your manure in the fall, in November, let's say, you know, then um, December, January, February, March, by, you know, end of March, you've hit 120 days. And so that's, you know, that would be a good time to apply your manure um, because you're not going to be harvesting the tomatoes most likely for a while. Uh, you don't want to wait until now to apply manure and the, onto tomatoes um, or where you're planting tomatoes and then expect to be able to harvest it. You know, that's 120 days might be pushing it. So, um, so when you're, and this is, I guess I should say tomatoes is kind of, um, maybe not, maybe, maybe one that you could only wait that you would not have to wait 120 days and 90 days might be enough, but boy, I'd feel safer waiting longer for sure. But like leafy greens, strawberries, you know, they grow right on the ground and things like onions or carrots, they're growing under the ground. You want to make sure that you're waiting at least 120 days from the time of raw manure application to the time of harvest. Um, things like sweet corn, although sweet corn isn't covered, but, you know, um, apples, whatever, they're growing up higher off the ground, um, then 90 days should be enough. But again, the longer, the better, uh, but between the time of application of the manure and the time of harvest. Okay, so, um, so we've talked about soil amendments, now we're going to talk about water. So when we're thinking about water, you know, think about the places where you might use water when you're growing produce. So, um, you know, thinking about um, pre-harvest as well as post-harvest. So, um, you know, for watering, for uh, irrigation, for um, mixing with chemicals, for fertilizer or, or insecticides of some sort. Um, and then post-harvest, uh, one thing that people don't always think about, you know, cause you might may or may not be rinsing your produce after harvest. Um, but you're hopefully washed, but you need to wash the, any surfaces that the produce might be resting on, you know, like the table where you're packing it or whatever. Um, and the containers that you're packing into and, um, you know, your hands that you're using to pack your produce, you want to make sure you're washing your hands as well. And so um, to wash your hands, um, particularly for anything after harvest, you have to make sure that that water is, um, is safe and of adequate sanitary quality. So um, when we think about, you know, sources of water, um, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that, you know, you have to think about obviously the cost of the water, um, I know. So my mom lives out in a, on a farm out in South Dakota and um, she just had to put a new well in because her um, the old well just wasn't working anymore. So they had to dig a new well. And then, um, you know, she also got rural water and she was telling me how much it costs to get rural water plumb to her house. And it was a lot. I don't remember the figure, but it was it was a lot. And digging a well is really expensive, too. So um you know, you have to balance out and, and in some places they just don't have the, you know, there's just not enough water. Um, like digging a well isn't practical. It's expensive and maybe there isn't much water there. So anyway, you have to think through um, the costs and the availability and all those things, you know, in conjunction with the level of risk. And so if you're using um, a municipal water source, so whether it's rural water or city water, um, you know, that's going to be lower risk because they're taking care of the, you know, who's providing the water to you, they're taking care of treating it. 
and making sure it's safe. Um, you know, you have to make sure it's safe from when it gets to your property to where it gets to your produce, but, but you know, it should be safe when it gets to your property. Um, groundwater is kind of in the middle, like it should be safe, but you know, things can happen. Um, there can be contamination of groundwater sources as well. Um, and then surface water is going to be higher risk. Um, but you know, in some cases that's what's available. So, um, you know, something, and, and also surface water would include, uh, rain barrels. So if you're collecting rain, um, off of a roof into a barrel of some sort, um, that would be considered surface water as well, because, um, you know, the rain came down on the roof and the roof's obviously exposed to the environment. There could be bird feces on the roof, and then that water is coming down into your storage container. Um, so you have to make sure you're thinking through, um, what am I doing to make sure to, to use this water as safely as possible? So um, this, this is, uh, you know, again, I know that people watching this might be interested in just food for produce, growing produce for their own consumption or for selling or for donating. So um, it is definitely a very good idea to test your water. Um, you know, if you're uh, no matter, no matter what, if you're just raising it for your own family's use, it's still a good idea to get your water tested. If you're using, um, if you're selling it, if you're wanting to get GAP certified, you have to test your water. And if you're covered by the rule, you have to test your post-harvest water. You wouldn't have to cover you wouldn't necessarily have to test your pre-harvest water, but it's a really good idea. And actually, I should say the, that water rule hasn't been finalized yet, so we're not sure. But anyway, testing your water is a really good idea. Um, in Kansas and Missouri, we do offer free water test, microbial water testing to produce growers. Um, other states um, might have other, um, uh, you know, realities, I guess, in terms of where you can get your water tested. Again, we have some information on our website that links to some um, national sources of information about water testing. But um, if you're using municipal water, you can get the results from, you know, the municipality or the rural water source. Um, and you don't have to test that unless you want to see what happens when it gets from, you know, the gate of your farm, so to say, to your produce, you can, you can still test it. Um, let me see. I'm going to, I won't go over this too much in the interest of time, but, um, so it's, it's for production water. You want the water to be the same quality that you would want it to be for swimming in. So recreational water quality is, the, is what we consider for safe swimming, like at beaches. So the, you know, the state, um, park and wildlife department might test the water to see if it's safe for people to swim there. Um, if it's safe for people to swim there, then it's the same level of safety as required for, or is a good idea for pre-harvest use of water. Um, post-harvest water, um, we want to make sure it's potable, like it's drinkable quality water. So, um, want higher quality there. Okay. So domesticated and wild animals, um, you know, animals are really hard to control <laughs> whether, whether it's a cat or a deer, you know, they, um, they don't always do what you want them to do. Uh, the thing is their feces can um, have uh, pathogens in it. it, can make people sick. So you do wanna make sure, and they can um, contaminate the water sources too. So you do wanna make sure that you're um, thinking through how we can prevent that. The big thing is you wanna check and make sure that you don't see any feces um, on or very close to whatever you're harvesting. Um, the example I often use is like an apple. And, you know, if you see white bird feces on that apple, um, you know, don't use that for selling or for eating raw. Um, you know, you, you should not, you should do something else with that. Um, so what can you do to help minimize animal uh, contamination and crop damage too? You know, if you get deer into your strawberries, well, you don't have many strawberries left or, you know, whatever it might be, birds um, and your berries. So, um, you know, you can use decoys, fencing, netting, um, you know, owls out there, or whatever that is. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different things you can do. Again, there's different costs associated with all this different levels of labor. Um, our, in most states, your extension, um, uh, there should be somebody in extension that could help with um, that could help with really uh, how to control wildlife better. Um, they um, 
uh, we have some resources on our website too that that do we have some videos that talk about things you can do that's with our extension wildlife specialist things you can do to help control um uh, help control animals Okay, so then we think about um, what we're harvesting into and what we're using to harvest. So um, you do want to make sure you're using washable harvest containers so that, you, you know, you're not putting that beautiful eggplant into something that's dirty. Um, and, you know, the tools that you're cutting with, your knives or whatever you might be using that you're cleaning and then sanitizing those as well so that they're not spreading contamination. You know, if you have contamination in... Um, one, um, you know, one head of lettuce or whatever, and you cut it with a knife and then you keep going through the whole day, then if there was feces on that knife, then you're spreading that feces everywhere. So you do need to clean and sanitize them occasionally, not every time, but you do need to, you know, not every, after every lettuce head, but you do need to make sure you're cleaning your and sanitizing your tools. Okay. So, you know, it's really hard to prioritize I mean, for me, it's hard to prioritize everything, but like when you're cleaning, what do you have to pay the most attention to? Um, so what the produce is touching directly, that's your first priority. Um, your second priority would be, you know, what's near it. Um, and then, you know, so then the floor would be the next concern and then outside would be kind of our fourth concern. So, um, you know, just making sure that you're really paying attention to what's directly touching the produce that that's not going to be contaminating the produce further. Um, washing and cooling, um, you know, so after you're harvesting, um, you know, it's it's not a requirement to wash your produce after harvest. It's not, um, it, it's not, it, it depends. It's not always a good idea. It's a lot of cases, it's better not to wash your produce after harvest. You know, sometimes you have to, but like if you can avoid it, it's better because you can reduce problems later. Um, there's a lot of produce, you know, things like berries, they, they don't hold up well if they're washed or green beans can get kind of get spotted if you wash them. So um, if you are going to wash, you have to do it properly. Um, and, and, you know, people don't like to buy lettuce that has dirt on it, of course. And, you know, I don't want to store dirty tomatoes in my, uh, you know, in my, wherever I'm storing my tomato or I say tomatoes, potatoes. You don't want to have dirty potatoes stored. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, taking care of things accordingly. But um, you have to make sure for post-harvest use that your water is potable. You can't just use like rain barrel water unless you're treating it um, in a controlled validated treatment. Um, but you want to make sure that you're um, using that high quality water um, for washing. You want to make sure your surfaces are cleanable. So like wood is not cleanable, uh, like a wood, like an actual wood, not a, uh, you know, a I don't know, I can't think of the right term, but like not a covered wood. It has, you know, got to be able to wash it and clean it. Um, and you're cleaning your packing containers. If you, it, It's a very good idea to use a sanitizer, whether you're doing a single pass, like spraying your produce, or if you're washing it in like a, a three bay sink, like as in the top picture there, um, it's a very good idea to use a sanitizer to prevent um, contamination from spreading from one, um, for, you know, one carrot to all the carrots. You want to make sure that you're um, using a sanitizer to help stop that spread. Cooling is very important also, um, like I talked about at the beginning, um, you know, getting that field heat out of your um, things like strawberries. Um, you know, if you can if you're holding it at field temperature, like if it gets up to 90 degrees and the strawberries are sitting there for like an hour after harvest, that's, that's like the same as keeping it at for a week at, you know, at a cool 32 degrees. So, you know, getting things cool after harvest is very important. Getting things as cool as you can and as cool as is good idea for that produce um, as quickly as you can is really, is really good. Um, and, and there's resources like UC Davis has some nice resources on like what temperature is the best temperature for, um, different produce to be stored at. Um, cause for some, like I said, like tomatoes, you don't want it too cold. You want to make sure it's cold enough, but not too cold. Okay. So transporting, you know, I grew up on a farm and I know what, you know, we, we didn't sell produce, but you know, I know what 
pickups are used for. They're used for all sorts of things. Um, and so you don't want to just put your vegetables, uh, your box of vegetables into a pickup that just had sheep in the back or whatever it might be. Um, so you do want to, you know, in this case, this pickup looks quite clean, so that's fine, but um, make sure you are, you know, thinking about that as well and, and that you're not spreading contamination um, just by the vehicle that you're using to haul things in. Okay, so personnel, it's always important to think about, um, you know, the people that are working, again, whether it's a restaurant or a food processing facility or um, whether it's a, a produce growing farm. Um, so we really want to make sure that everybody's using good health and hygiene practices, um, that everybody's trained on washing their hands and on using the toilet. You know, you want to make sure that that people are not going using the field as their toilet, but that they're using an actual toilet. Um, that that's really important to not spread germs. Um, make sure that, you know, if somebody is sick, whether it's you or one of your family members or whoever, that they're, um, that they're not, you know, touching the produce. Um, because if you are, you know, have diarrhea or if you've been vomiting, you know, that still could be on you and on your hands and whatever. And, um, then if you're touching the produce, that's now you're spreading it to the produce. So um, we just need to make sure that people, you know, whether you have volunteers on your farm or again, your family or whoever it might be that everyone is, is using these good practices. Um, so it's always important to have, uh, you know, clean, accessible, stocked bathrooms. So you need paper towels, you need soap, you need water, you know, you need to make sure that those things are all in place. Um, you know, always having hand washing nearby is very important. Um, if the hand washing, if you have to walk a little ways to wash your hands, it's not likely people will do it. So you want it to be, you know, close by, make sure that people are doing a good job washing their hands. Um, and this is an example of a hand washing station that you can do, you know, whether you're providing samples at a farmer's market or you're, uh, you know, growing produce, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy, doesn't have to be expensive, but that um, you need to make sure there's a continuous flow spigot is important so that, you you know, if you're having to push a button, you can only put like one hand under there. But if you, if the water is just continuously flowing, you can, you know, use both hands and really get both hands clean. Um, doing like this doesn't really work very well. Okay, so it's always important to uh, just remind people to wash their hands. Like there's been studies that have been done that show you know, just reminding people to wash their hands is important. So um, using wetting your hands, using soap, lathering, rinsing, you know, these sometimes these steps seems like, yeah, I know, but sometimes a reminder is helpful for everyone. Uh, record keeping is important as well. Again, if you're if you're um, selling your produce, then and if you're covered by the produce safety rule, you're required to keep records. If you are wanting to get GAP certified, then um, you also have to you're required to keep records um, in that case as well. If you're you know donating the produce or using it for your home consumption, it's a good idea. Um, maybe not necessarily a requirement, but certainly a good idea. Um, so a farm food safety plan is something that is, it's not required just by the, the Food Safety Modernization Act produce safety rule, the regulation, um, but it is, a farm food safety plan is required if you're wanting to get GAP certified. So, um, so again, it's a good, I, it's a good idea to have no matter what, you know, but, um, and we have some templates on our website that you could use if you do ever need to get GAP certified that can help you with this. So um, I talked quite a bit about our uh, K-State uh, and MU Extension uh, produce safety website. Um, in fact, I saw our um, K-State uh, web K-State food safety extension website guru was on earlier. Uh, Karen Blakesley does a wonderful job uh, keeping our website updated for us. Um, so um, I work for both universities, but um, Karen does such a great job. It's all our resources are on our, on the purple website. So, um, but there's, you know, lots of resources here that are, everyone's welcome to use. Um, again, whether you're selling or donating or consuming it yourself, these are all good practices to use. Um, and, um, you know, they're applying all the states. So, so please um, help yourself to that website if you're interested.
Um, so as, as I mentioned, I wanted to talk just a little bit specifically about donating food. Um, so, you know, donating food is something that, um, is, is wonderful. And my next slide talks more about it, but, um, so this is a fact sheet that we developed, um, at, at K-State, um, a few years ago, but, um, I think I have a link to it later in the presentation. I might've sent it to, um, Julia ahead of time, I hope, but, um, so this fact sheet uh, just talks about, you know, the the foods, the food safety, and then also the nutrition um, aspects of donating um, food to food pantries and soup kitchens. Um, again, most of this is just best practices, not really state specific, although there's a little bit in there. Um, so food donations, you know, they are an important source of food for families that, you know, are just struggling to have enough um, food and particularly to have enough safe and healthy food. Um, you know, and fresh produce, man, is so beneficial for everybody to have more fresh produce, but it can be expensive. Um, I know even when I go to the store, you know, my, one of my kids would love me to, would love it if I bought unlimited strawberries every week, but like, you know, we can't, and it's not good for him anyway, but, but, um, you know, we can all use more fresh fruits and vegetables, but they can be expensive. So, um, you know, donating food is a great thing to do. Um, I did want to be sure to mention um, that there is something called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act um, that was put into place in um, 1996. Um, so that does reduce your liability as long as your donation is made in good faith. So if you're, um, you know, again, like I mentioned at the beginning, I haven't met anybody that's trying to make other people sick, but, you know, I guess maybe those people just don't talk to somebody like me, but, um, but, you know, if, as long as you're, you know, you are not trying to make people sick, this act will help to, um, reduce your liability if there ever was a problem with food you donated. So, so, um, so you can feel more comfortable with, with donating, um, produce. Um, I will say, um, it's the bottom, uh, bullet point here, but I did want to make sure to bring that out, um, that it is really important though, to check with your local food pantry to see if they accept produce, because not every food pantry is really equipped to handle it. Um, you know, especially in the summer, uh, things like tomatoes, you know, strawberries, boy, they can go bad really fast. And if they don't have, um, refrigeration, you know, again, particularly for those strawberries, if they don't have refrigeration, um, you know, if they don't have adequate storage, even for watermelons or something, you know, how are they going to distribute those watermelons? So you do want to check with your local food pantry if they'll accept produce. And a lot of times they might not just because of logistical concerns. Um, we also have a fact sheet. I didn't list it on here, but we developed a fact sheet, I think a year or so ago for um, food safety and blessing boxes. Um, so I know like the church that we go to has a blessing box in the parking lot, which I think is great. Um, but I always check to make sure there's no like, uh, perishable produce in there, especially in the summer. Uh, you know, we wouldn't want some strawberries rotting in there or, um, you know, whatever it might be. We don't want something like that kind of rotting in there and, and attracting pests and, and, uh, causing other problems. So, um, so always check to make sure uh, that you can donate um, produce to your local food pantry. Um, and, do and produce donations are another, food donations in general are a great way to help reduce food waste. You know, so much of our food in the U.S. is wasted, which is very sad. Um, you know, so it's great to donate it um, if you can to, to humans first. And then, you know, if, if it's not fit for human consumption, animal consumption is another another, um, the next tier down. Um, but I think, I think we have some of that in our fact sheet. I was just going to check. No, I think it might be a different fact sheet that I have. I have one on reducing food waste where we talk about that too, but all right. So, um, here's some resources that we have on, um, the food waste and, and the food donation side of thing. Um, so, um, again, there's some great resources from our, some of our colleagues at NC state and university of Wisconsin and university of Missouri and K-State have some, uh, resources, like I mentioned too, on, on donating food and, and doing it, um, as safely as possible. So, um, so with that, I am happy to, um, take any questions that anybody might have. All right. So you do have a question. Is it safe to use my collected rainwater that I've collected in a never used garbage can and I keep the lids on? 
just to water my flowers and bushes. Would it be okay to use it also on peach and apple trees? I've done this in the past. I've never tested the water and I've never used it in my garden. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, things like uh, peach and apple trees, you know, as long as you're not using overhead sprinkler irrigation, which I would guess you're probably not, um, you know, if you're um, watering it at the base, that is going to reduce your risk a lot. And, um, you know, I wouldn't recommend to so, so make sure that you're not like the big thing is if if don't um, do overhead irrigation, you know, some sort of um, overhead sprinklers of that. If you're watering at the base, that will really reduce your risk a lot. Um, if you are, um, you know, another thing you can do is make sure you're not using it like right before harvest, like uh, even a week before harvest would be better, you know, so um, four or five days at least between the time you're applying that water and the time you're harvesting will help to reduce um, a lot of the risk. So yeah, just make sure you're using it, not overhead, directly applying it to the base and then um, and then leaving as many days as possible between the time of uh, watering and the time of harvest will help. And I'll add another note about that. I have a colleague who had a rain barrel in his backyard and his child was getting drinks of water out of the rain barrel and ended up really, really sick. In fact, he had something that was reportable to the state health department. So not funny, but this can happen. So you have to be really cautious with collecting water. Um, Lana, could you share any more information about the act that you mentioned, the Bill Emerson Act? Yeah, and I apologize that I didn't um, I didn't prepare well for that question. So I apologize. I don't. Um, I think in that publication that I mentioned, um, and on, just being honest, it's been a while since we yeah, we developed this publication, like in 2017. So it's been a little while. I'm pretty sure that in this publication we have a link to that act. Um, so. Um, if you could look that up on our website, just type in that um, title at go to our K-State website and type that in. You should be able to find it. Um, and I know it's on our um, this. Uh, well, OK, that's just our food safety page. But then there's a, a sub page from our food safety extension page that talks about food waste. And then um, I know that that publication is on there. Anyway, I'm pretty sure that we have a link to that act um, on that in that fact sheet, so that can provide you with more information. Um, you know, I will say I'm not a lawyer, and so I can't give uh, very good legal advice. But um, you know, I will say that that um, uh, let me see. You know, it does it reduces liability. Oops, I went the wrong way there. Um, it reduces liability. It doesn't eliminate liability, but it does reduce liability. I, I, if I remember correctly, there has not been, you know, any problems with people getting sued for donating food that's made anybody sick. I don't think that there's been problems with that, but, um, but, you know, some uh, large food companies are concerned about that happening. So they, um, I think that's one of the reasons why this act was passed to help food companies feel more comfortable donating food um, and not having any legal liability problems because of it. You have another question. How about using sump water on vegetable gardens? Yeah, another great question. Um, I would use the same principle um, because boy, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting in my basement right next to our sump pump right now. <laughs> so um, so it's kind of a topic fresh on my mind. Um, and our sump pump froze this winter. Uh, and so I had to like bucket out the water bucket by bucket this winter. So anyway, I'm quite uh, into sump pump water lately. Um, but I will say, um, again, I would use the same principle as I mentioned with using rain barrel water on um, things like, you know, peach trees and apple trees. Um, you know, make sure you extend the amount of time as much as possible from the time of application of the water to the time of harvest. With water, you know, four or five days is a good amount of time. With manure, we talked about, you know, like four months, but with water, you know, at least four or five days from the time you apply it to the time you harvest will really reduce your risk. Um, and then, um, 
you know, if you're not using overhead irrigation, that helps a lot too. So if you're, but if you're, you know, I would not probably use that on carrots, you know, cause they're growing underground and, and that water would be directly touching the carrots, but, you know, using it on peppers, I would feel more comfortable with. And as long as you're applying the water, you know, at the roots and not overhead, or if you're leaving, you know, like I said, five days in between time of application and harvest, that that helps quite a bit too. And I'll just add that Londa and I have both been involved in teaching the FISMA produce safety rule courses, and those are offered periodically both face-to-face -face around the region. And we just did an online version not too long ago. Um, some of our people presenting were in Minnesota. I was at NDSU and some were in Bismarck. So mm -hmm. great modern technology. But if you do find that, hey, I'm selling more than $25,000, then you better look more closely at that FISMA requirement um, for having somebody certified. And it's about an eight hour training, mm -hmm. not too hard, but it's, it's good to have the certificate. Yeah, we actually have one coming up. I think it's next week, but it's it's full. But um, but yeah, we will offer some more later this summer as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead and type them in the chat. And we will be posting the archive of this along with some of those resources that Londa's been mentioning. So please. You know, check out the archives. If you missed any of the Field to Fork webinars, we had a lot of great topics this year in our 11 webinars. I'm just seeing a thank you. And so I will add my thank you to Londa. And I wish you well in your new adventure. And Karen Blakesley just posted the Bill Emerson Law link. And I'm going to grab it and post it to everybody if anyone wants to look at this. There Thanks, you go. Karen. Perfect. So again, thanks to everybody. And I hope you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and have very productive gardens this summer. <laughs> so thank you. Mm -hmm.